have mercy, look at how the time goes. And welcome everybody to this episode of the Coming Home Seems Podcast so with, with jo- oh, What's the name of this podcast? The Coming Home Podcast <laughs> with John Allen. That's my name, John Allen. And the lovely laughter you hear in the background is my guest for today, Miss Kim Fairchild. Hi, Kim. Hello, John. <laughs> <laughs> that was a mouthful. Oh, boy. Uh, you know, it, it's a little early. It's 10 o'clock in the morning here in Norway. Let me take a sip of my morning coffee. Uh, skull. <laughs> <laughs> ah, there we go. Uh, that helps. Um, thank you for doing this, Kim. Yes. You know, you I, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot from the get go, uh, because I asked you to do this quite some time ago, and you were a little bit hesitant to come on. Yes. What was the reason for your hesitation? Um, the reason was that I was kind of, you know, uh, blown away about all this COVID-19 stuff, and I was a bit afraid. And uh, I, I really, um, I really just felt like hiding away for a while. And then I saw um, all my friends, all my musician friends, and everybody, you know, going out there and making those videos from their bedrooms and and kitchens and playing songs and telling people to, oh, whips me some money because now I'm broke because of COVID. And, and I just thought, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. So I kind of just was, I was kind of standoffish to everything. Right. I understand that. You know, it was, um, and, and you're right. When I first asked you about this, this if I am not mistaken, this was around the middle of March, right when the COVID situation was really starting yes. to hit Norway. Um, I believe it was the day after I had been out. I had done a stand-up gig in Oslo, and it was really spooky. It was like a Stephen King novel or something from the train yes. where I right. live and into Drummond. I'm sorry, from Drummond where I live and into Oslo to do that gig. Yeah. I think maybe two or three people got on the train, and that yes. is not normal. And it was... No, it's not. And people, the streets were totally empty. Uh, we had a good yeah. crowd at the club, but but yeah. the, but the city and the train ride in it was it was it was creepy. So yeah, I, and, it, and I find it still creepy because now it's like oh we're kind of tired of sitting inside, <laughs> so we just gonna, we're just gonna make up our minds that it's not so dangerous anymore. So now I'm really freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, so so far Norway has done a pretty good job of containing everything if i'm yes. not mistaken i saw in the news today there's only 10 new cases in the last two days in all of norway and that's pretty good yes, however that's good. however like you say if people relax too much yeah then we might have a resurgence it might come back it might hit us yeah, harder you, know, you were talking about this stephen king thing you know the typical thing that would happen in a stephen king movie is that everybody's going to feel fine and every, everything is going to blow over. And then in, you know, in six months, somebody is going to get sicknesses you, that you get after the thing, you know, like, like an after blow. <laughs> and then suddenly people are going to be, oh, I'm so, I don't feel, I don't feel well. And then, I'm, you know, every kind of weird sicknesses is going to hit the public, you know, <laughs> that, that's me. That's, that's me. That's uh, so I'm just kind of, you know, watching out of my, Bunker. <laughs> I guess I, I am I'm cautious. I don't think I'm overly cautious, but I'm cautious. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say I'm worried, but I am concerned. Uh, mm-hmm. But I do count myself and my family among the fortunate. We, you know, th- this whole situation has not really cramped our family life at all. Uh, no. We saw that our two kids, uh, we have a teenager and a preteen, uh, a, girl, oh, yeah. a girl and a boy. And we saw that um, from March all the way until the end of the school year, now in June, they actually did better with their schoolwork, uh, yeah. doing schoolwork from home, uh, you know, with the good internet connections that Norway has. Yeah. So that was actually a bonus. An- another bonus was that at least I, uh, my wife is terrible at math and things like that, but I felt closer to my children being able to follow up their schoolwork in a way that I wasn't able to because of course they they before that they were at school all day long. Yes. So so it, it created a new bond with with my kids. It also I created a, a new of, of, of parents that yeah. had the same experience. Yeah. As you. Yeah. Now you you have kids but they're grown, correct? They're grown. Um and they live in Bergen, you know, so they're grown. They don't need me to help them with their homework. Uh. 
So, uh, but I think I, I was kind of worried uh, about kids um, under COVID-19 that should be in school and wasn't, and don't have, you know, they don't have parents that are uh, uh, um, yes. able to help them. Yeah. And, and, and that's and why I can't. Worse, some, have, some have parents that shouldn't be parents <laughs> in the first place. You know, well, with uh, drugs and alcohol and and uh, abuse and stuff. So I was kind of worried for for for, for those kind of kids yeah. and those kind of families. And that's good that you say that uh, because uh, in, you know, in the same to, to continue my sentence, where I say that I and my family have not been adversely affected by this situation. Uh, you know, uh, mm. dot dot dot, <laughs> but. <laughs> Several families have been adversely affected. We've seen uh, in the statistics, we see a rise of domestic abuse. We see a rise in in uh, children uh, displaying psychological uh, uh, problems because, unfortunately, school was where they were getting their main, you know, school was their main source of support. And yeah, I'm, when they're no I'm longer right. there, they suffer. I'm sorry? And a break from all the ugliness at home. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. You know, um, I saw that you had uh, posted some pictures of, your, was it your daughter and grandchild? Yes. Just a couple of days ago. It, I, I, have to, I have to laugh. It was so, and I love your sense of humor. You're not afraid to, to poke fun at yourself. Where you posted yeah. that video of you throwing the axe. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, look at this badass strong woman getting ready to throw an axe, and then you threw the axe, and I'm like, look at this awkward <laughs> non axe throwing woman throw an axe. It totally, when you threw the axe, it totally shifted my mindset. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I think I'm not good with the axe, but I'm <laughs> definitely dangerous. <laughs> you know, you are dangerous. You are dangerous. You, uh, you're, you're kind of fearless. Oh, you're kind of fearless online. You, uh, you make something. Yeah. You make something of a figure of yourself in these, in these debates about social issues, not just in Norway, but in general. Where does that strength come from? Because you, you tolerate a lot of. Well, I don't. I don't want to say you tolerate it, but you are the recipient of a good amount of abuse online because of the stances you take. Where does yes. that strength come from? Um, uh, I always think of myself as I want to be the person I needed when I was young. Ah, in other words, you're trying to be something that was missing. Yes, and and uh, and uh, uh, it, it was, you know, um, I'm kind of uh, getting getting older, so I'm I'm 54 this year. So Stop I moved it. to Norway when I was so. <laughs> Yes, thank you. <laughs> I moved to Norway when I was about uh, when I was two years old, and you know that was um, Norway was back then a country that you know nobody talked about anything that was kind of uh, uh, shady or, or oh, sad or yeah, or, controversy was not about, spoken on. Right, and and um, it so happens that that I I was kind of uh, furious already then as a child and you know i always thought that um the color was uh, my, my skin my skin color was the thing that made me different from everybody else around me but it it wasn't it was me <laughs> <laughs> okay what aspect of you though is it that was different that i i i kind of have a a, a extremely strong imagination I can imagine anything, and I often I have big dreams, and uh, I always thought that I would be able to do anything I put my mind to, and I was always very proud of um, of my brain. Yeah, because I thought uh, uh, a lot of people do not use the full potential, you know, and and that irritates the hell out of me i don't if, if you have a talent and you're good at something first of all never do it for free amen <laughs> wait a minute say that again say that again <laughs> if you're good at something never do it for free i'm because waving my fist in the air talent. yes that is your talent and your talent is your crown you have to wear it uh, with pride and 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 with 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 fearless 
strategy. That is so beautifully said. Ladies and gentlemen, Kim Fairchild, <laughs> we, could, we could almost end this discussion right there. That's so beautifully said. Uh, I am a proponent of artistic talent and of the proliferation of artistic talent. I am a proponent of the artist, whatever that art is, uh, being compensated for what they give to society. I love that you have said that. I don't think I've met anyone in Norway who has touched on that topic with a more clear statement than the one you made just now. Yeah, and you know, that is the, also the problem with um, 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 me being a, a musician and an artist because I realized that in Norway, um, um, you know, everything that has to do with culture, with, with you know, with, with, with painting or singing or playing the instruments or, 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 or theater or, or whatever, it's like, it's just cozy. It's not important. Yeah. I don't no. think I don't think a lot of people ad, uh, appreciate the work that we do to build our no. craft. First of all, to build no, our craft, no. and then second of all, to to promote our craft. They don't understand right. the work that goes into that. And I think, and that that is something I, I so I studied. I went to Denmark and I went to Finland and I went went to Sweden and I just talked to people and I talked to children and and young people and you know. Um, like um uh, um you know like everything that has to do with your culture especially music and art is in their schools yes for yeah. real you know so 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 the, they learn all about how um you know if you let's say you, you want to do something about a musician in school then you can learn history you can learn where did the blues come from where did it start and 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 the hip-hop that you dig now where did it start you know and like this you could learn history you can learn geography you could learn um um, um empathy Everything. M music and, is and music. This is what they do in other in other countries, but in Norway, it's just like it's just like something cozy you do on your free time. Now, now this traveling that you did to the, to to these different countries was this in combination with something music related or work related, yeah. or was it just yeah. in your you know you're taking a trip and you run into people? I took a trip to run into people to talk to them you to learn. Okay, so that was the main that was the goal to actually go to these yeah. countries and dip your feet in the social and cultural yeah. atmosphere. Wow, yes. amazing. I did that because nobody else did it. So I thought, well, you're sitting here complaining. Amazing. Do it, do it yourself. <laughs> Amazing. I've never heard of I've never heard of anybody doing that. Basically, oh. you did a documentary without the camera. <laughs> yes, I did. And I learned that um, music is important in school in other Nordic countries, but not in Norway. I knew I knew I, I knew there was a reason why I liked you so much. <laughs> We, so you, you know, I'm kind of crazy in in in, in, in that way, and many people say, "So why why are you going to Finland and Denmark?" I, I have to talk to people and see how they live, and I have to find out what 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 do they understand that uh, the Norwegian school system do not seem to understand, and this is the only way to find out. So now, what kind of uh, what kind of environment were you seeking? Did you go to Did you go to uh, you know to clubs or music venues? Or did you Were you a guest speaker? Yes, I went to music venues and uh, I wanted to talk to to uh, you know young people. And you know it's it's kind of uh, it's kind of weird if you just hang out outside schools, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> a black grown up woman hanging. Out. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and there's a way to do it and then there's a way not to do it yes <laughs> yeah well i kind of just put on my smiley face and uh and uh went to um you know where where, where the kids um um roller skate and yeah. do the core and stuff and uh and i said hello i'm from norway could i just talk to you hello and they came and they talked to me and i asked them about schooling and i asked them about what do they learn in school and, and, and what music uh, means to them and why they listen to what they do, if they know uh, where it, it comes from. And, and, and it's, 
It really is that easy. People from Finland and Denmark and, and, and Sweden are more educated in the music history and all everything that has to do with art than Norwegian are. Do you think they have more of an appreciation for it then because they have that yeah. historical background? Well, you know, and it's some, if, if you go to Great Britain or you go to um, uh, Denmark and you say, well, um, uh, people ask you, what do you do? Well, I'm a singer and an actress. And they say, oh, that's interesting. If you say that here for many years, I was like, oh, but can you can you make a living of that? Let's talk about that for a second, about making a living at it. Um, well, well, before we get to that, let me ask you, how long ago was it that you took this trip, the, these trips, and were asking people? How many years ago was this? I was 23. 23. Wow. Mm -hmm. Two years ago and nothing, then. And nothing has changed. Two years ago then. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I just love you. I just love you, Miss Kim. I just love you. Um, <laughs> it's my show and I'll flirt if I want to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Z snap. Um, no, so, so this, this, the, this whole thing about, you know, a, a lot of people can claim or not claim, but they can say that they are an artist, but there's very few who can, who can say that they live off of it, but you are now living exclusively off of, the combination of music and acting, yeah. uh, art, in other words. Yeah. Yes. How, how, talk, talk about that path. How did you get, because it is extremely difficult in Norway. Uh, you yes, know, if you, if, if a person, if an artist sells 5,000 records in Norway, that's a success. You go to mm -hmm. other countries and that's nothing. So it says a little bit about how receptive the Norwegian audience is to art. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. you so that you were able to live off of it is quite exceptional. Yes, you know, I, I started off. Uh, I started out as a singer, and uh, I got noticed because yes, I can sing. And then um, I, I, I uh, you know, I was kind of surprised when I saw that that didn't matter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I was because you know I thought, okay, now I'm on TV, I'm singing, I'm looking good, I'm young. Yes, I'm gonna be the next Tina Turner. That's what I thought. <laughs> you know, I was going, I was like, oh yeah, look at me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because you were quite, then, you were, you were very often on TV. You've also been on radio, correct? Yes. And and you had that yes. exposure, but at the time, it didn't I lead did. to very much. No, and it just like. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and then it was nothing, and I was like sitting waiting for the phone to ring. Mm -hmm, it's gonna happen, mm -hmm. and nothing happened. Nothing. And I was so discouraged, and I was so uh, disappointed, and I thought, okay, then you are doing something wrong. Okay, and what did you did, what did what? you conclude then? I conclude that if I was uh, singing in the Norwegian language, I would perhaps make it better but then i tried and i i went to um the the melody grand prix yes you know and that was in 1993 i think and uh it came second and still nothing nothing happened <sighs> So uh, I thought, okay, you have to do something else now. So for a while, I just stopped singing. I needed to think. You know, I am I, I'm not like most women. I cannot have 15 balls in the air at the same time. No. I have to think through one topic at a time. I see. I see. And then, you know, and then I, I kind of like do it. Uh, uh, to me, it's mathematics, you know. If I do 60% in this effort, I can only do 40% on that other effort. Exactly. You cannot have, you know, five different things you want to do and make 100% effort in everything. That's impossible. That's impossible. Yeah. Even though a lot of people in our um, community, like uh, musicians and arts, that's exactly what they're doing. And I think they're on a path to, I mean, you can sustain that for a while and some people su sustain it quite successfully for a while, but in the end, yeah. you know, it, it's, 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 it, it's obvious if you burn a candle at both ends, eventually the candle will burn out and it will burn out yeah. quicker than if it's only burning at one end. Yes. 
So um, I thought I was okay, I'll try acting. So I had some friends who, who, who was doing this revi in Stavang, and uh, they asked me if I want to come. And then I did that for 12 years every summer. Oh, uh, this is in a theater, and, this is in a theater yeah, type of... Uh, cabaret thing yeah, yeah. going on, and it was really good. And then I, when I had done that for about four years, um, in the audience, there was this um, um, uh, chief of the of the national theater, also the, the Riksteater, and she said, That's on a, Monday, for, let me let me just interrupt for the non Norwegian speakers. That is the national uh, theater here in Norway. Yeah, it's the troubling theater. Yes, yeah, just for the yes. benefit of the non Norwegian speakers. Yeah. Yes, and <laughs> uh, and uh, she said. Um, you should come up to my office on Monday. I want to talk to you. And so I did. And uh, that started my career as an actor. And this is in the middle to late 90s, right? Yeah, this was uh, in the beginning of uh, 2000. Okay, yeah, yeah. So since then, I've actually been an actor. Mm. And I have been, you know, um, acting in all these theaters in um, in Norway, yeah. a lot of them, and, and I like it. Have you gotten any television gigs for acting? Uh, no. It's just, it's theater for now. Yes, yeah. it's theater. And I'd like to, you know, I'd like to go into a TV series or, or maybe a movie or something. Sure. But sure. maybe, maybe it come. I am getting in my, you know, icon age. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Hey, I'm just a few years behind you, so all this talk that you're saying about you're getting old is kind of making me a little, a little bit nervous. A little cold sweat is starting no, to come. No, I, <laughs> you know, I don't think um, getting older is something that, in my, in, in, in my line of work, of course, it's, it's not good. But then I have all this experience and I have all this knowledge and uh, I'm actually getting quite wise. And I'm still fearless, so I'll find something to do with it. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I think you are far from finished. And, and I agree with you about the age thing. You know, I, I, don't, I don't live my life according to some arbitrary number where, yeah. where, where society decides what you can and cannot do. Uh, I, I just don't, I, I don't believe that. I'm 51 and I'm far from finished and I'm getting better at yeah. everything I do. So. Yeah, but, and that's and that's the thing, you know. We do live in this world that you know. I'm a hippie. I will always be a hippie, and uh, I always think that you should not always do what you're told, and you should definitely not think what you are told to think. I love and it. I never, I never did, yeah. and uh, you know, it got me in a lot of trouble in school, you know. Can we go um, back? Um, can we go back to your school days? You said earlier when we, you said earlier when we were talking that you had big dreams as a child. What were yes. those dreams? Those dreams were to do something that I was good at and getting paid for it. Mm. Because you know, um, like a lot of <laughs> other uh, parents, my mother wanted me to sing, yes, but she also wanted me to become a lawyer. Ah. You know, or a dentist, you know, the same story, you know, have a nice job, get married, get two kids, get a car and, and a boat and the house and everything. And that was never for me. I never wanted those kind of things in my life. I wanted to travel. I wanted to, to, to live, you know, half a year in, 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 uh, in, in the jungle. So you had that sense of adventure at a very young age. Yes. And you never lost and, it. I think and, all kids have that, but some kids lose it. Yes, and I never lost it. Yeah. And you know, that is, that is um, in the beginning, it came in the way of getting an education, of getting a job, of getting uh, a partner. Because, yeah. you know, I was like, we are <laughs> the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that can be a little intimidating. That can be intimidating yeah, for some people. And that's cute when you're five. It's yeah. cute when you're ten. It's it's troubling when you're fifteen, and when you're twenty-five, it's like people are just looking at you and like, okay, um, yeah. please, yeah. Would you, when are you going to grow up? 
it could be a lonely it could be a lonely existence have you ever felt loneliness in your life most of the times i feel lonely really but are you comfortable with that yes you are i love it i've learned to appreciate it yeah i've learned because uh, a long time i was uh, you know i could be it wasn't that i didn't have you know opportunities because people would people would uh, um invite me even when i was a kid people kids would invite me to come and play and i would kind of uh prefer to take a walk in the woods and think i see and uh, my mom said well you will grow out of that and i never did uh huh i still prefer to take a walk in the woods instead of going to town have a beer and dance on tables <laughs> i don't think there's a table i don't think there's a table with legs strong enough for me to dance on otherwise i'd probably be I dancing on some tables, dance on tables. <laughs> But I do prefer to, you know, sit on the beach and write, and I do prefer to just have a walk in the woods and talk to the trees, and, and you know, I do those kinds of things. So, yes. I'm the uh, same way. I'm, I'm, I'm lonely, but um, it's very seldom I feel that it's a bad thing. I like those moments of solitude. Um, <clears throat> you know, you're, you're, you're from Bergen, or, or at least the Bergen area. Are you, born, are you from the, the city of Bergen, or... Yeah, I'm from the island Oshkey. Okay, outside, outside of Bergen. Bergen yeah, yes. my my wife and kids. You know, to speak to this thing about uh, this issue of loneliness, my wife and kids are on a car trip in Bergen right now. Um, oh. they've been gone since um, what was it? Was it Monday they left? So I have all yeah. week until tomorrow, five five days uh, alone. Mm -hmm. And. If, if one were to ask me if I'm lonely, yes, I'm lonely. And then if they ask me, well, how do you feel about it? I would say I feel great. Yes. Because I can, I have this opportunity <clears throat> uh, and I cherish these opportunities where I can, you know, breathe out, lower my shoulders, go into that artistic part of my brain yes. and get some writing done, whether it's yes. music or lyrics or mm -hmm. work on some material for, um, uh, for different projects, you know, um, mm -hmm. talk to my great podcast guests and things like that. I, I don't fear that loneliness. Um, no, because you know, there's a difference between being uh, alone and lonely. Exactly. exactly. Two different things. I'm often alone, but I'm very seldom I feel lonely because it's like uh, I'm used to being alone. You know, you, uh, so, so now you know this this COVID nineteen quarantine thing. It. It's not doing me any harm. You're on my turf now. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it's it's. Um, I think you and I think a lot alike in that aspect. It's it's. Um, and believe me, I don't. I don't want to just brush aside the uh, the tragedy and the trauma that people are experiencing no. with COVID nineteen. But, but for me, this has been a period now, a four month period now of, and I'm always reflective. I'm always, you know, in, into that inner voice type of thing. But now yes. I've gone even deeper into that introspection. Yes. I've gone even yes. deeper into that artist, artistic aspect okay. of my life. Um, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not afraid of the isolation. I'm not afraid of the, the, the loneliness, so to speak. It seems like you and yeah, I think a lot of like... And you can't be, and I'm like, uh, I understand that people get lonely. Sure, and of sure. Course, I, I miss a hug. I miss, uh, I miss being with, with, with somebody. And, uh, you know, I can't even remember what a kiss feels like. Yeah. <laughs> or what you say after you've been kissed. <laughs> now that's a whole nother thing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I can't remember, but then in the, in, and then I think being alone, you know, we're all uh, adapting to this new day we yes, have. Yes, yes. And uh, I think uh, a lot of people is doing good, and then a lot of people is whining about it, you know. And I think, well, you know, we are the product of thousands of years of evolution. Come on, act like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we, we will adapt. It's a new day. So, you know, and that's um, like Stephen Hawking said. He said that uh, intelligence is how you adapt to changes. 
So would that then be fair to extrapolate that statement and say that those who do, who do not adapt are lacking in intelligence? I think so. And of course, that is a strong opinion. But I, I do think so, because, <clears throat> of course, you can be intelligent without using your intelligence. Yeah, that's true. Of course, we are so used to, you know, you go on Facebook and then somebody thinks that I think this is the right and I think this and you put like and you say, oh, yeah, I think this, I think this too. I think this too. And you never thought it through. Exactly. There's you know? too much of that. There's too much of that happening. I think so. One of the down, one of the downsides of social media is that it has cut off the will, the very will to be a thinking person. Yes. And you know, um, somebody, it, it looks like somebody thinks that just to uh, put aside uh, what expert says is the same as thinking uh, on your own. It's not. It's not. No. It, it, it's not. You know, thinking uh, for yourself, uh, um, you know, if, if, you, if you think that, okay, COVID-19, somebody made it or, or somebody, or, or it was this bat or, or <laughs> whatever <laughs> happened. <laughs> Well, it just, you make up your mind, you should read everything about it, and you should read every side of it, and you should read every expert's uh, um, saying about it, and then you make up your mind yeah. who you're going to believe. But you know? so, so many people, they have uh, one conspiracy theorist on YouTube that they follow, and that's where they base their opinions on. And it amazes me that people have stopped thinking they just see no. something. They see something that is easy for them to 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 to, to support in some online yes. forum on social media, yeah. and that's what they go with, with no thought, yeah. no analysis, no. no criticism whatsoever. They just run with that, and they do not think. Uh, so yeah. uh, social media is dumbing people down big time. Yes, it is. If you if you if you don't use it in the right way, you know, and it's like it's like I think that maybe if you if you just sometimes, sometimes I take a break, sometimes I take a break, maybe two weeks. I do not post anything on Facebook or Instagram. I miss you when I that happens. Not, yes, and I do <laughs> not go in there and I just put it away. And you suddenly, my brain starts to work completely different. Absolutely. I start thinking about, hmm, why is that? I have to find that out. Okay, so this is, you know, I start interacting with the questions of, you know, the big questions, the small questions and everything. And I question everything. No. You cannot tell me to believe this if I don't think it's logic. Well, bl blind belief is an exercise in futility and, and, and ignorance. Yes. And, you know, you know, it's like uh, stupidity is, is the new high. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and I, I just can't, you know, and, and I think it will pass. I think so. Like, I think so. Yeah, but I think people is kind of panicking and struggling to finding their way, you know, because life is, 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 is hard. But then you have to adapt and you have to find the little good things. Yeah. And yeah. if you find one little good thing, you can kind of fold it out and make it bigger. There you go. Expand on it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's what I do. I find this little good thing and I expand it. And then I wrap it around all my entire life, everything I think, everything I do. And suddenly I wake up in the morning and I think, ah, oh, this is a good day, COVID-19. I don't care. I don't have job. No, I don't care. Do I have food? Do I have clean water? The sun is shining. Let's go. <laughs> there you <My> go. Day. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I want to ask you? I, I, I love to hear you talk. Um, the, the, you have a, you have a mixture of influences in your speech when you speak English. Uh, yeah. Explain to the people because I hear touches of British English. I hear touches of the regular Norwegian way of speaking English, and I hear touches of American English. Yes. How have all of those influences come into your way of speaking English? Say a little bit about your background, your family makeup, and and whatnot. Yeah, you know, I was born in. Uh in the New, New York City in the States in 1966 in New York. I'm half Jamaican and half Italian. 
and it's my mother that's Jamaican and so my Italian father uh, died and uh, my mother she then met this tall Norwegian guy sailor fell in love married him and he wanted to go back to Norway he was from Oske outside Norway and uh, he took my mom and me with him how old were you when you came to Norway I was two years old okay so your so your father died quite young when you were when you were yeah. quite young then okay yeah. yeah so you probably have no memory of him no no okay and so like all other kids I learned to talk uh, Norwegian very fast even though English was my first uh, language and then when I came to school we we was uh, thought English and the English teachers back then were really bad. Uh, <laughs> but I learned to talk English like that, you I know. Yeah. It, it, you know, and, yeah. and then I, and then I went to. Uh, I had a period of my life when I was young. I went a lot to London because I wanted to buy the clothes. I wanted to go to the clubs. I wanted to dance on the tables. I wanted to do all that <laughs> stuff that young people want to do. And so uh, I had this American accent and they kind of, well, you're American. You can't be American. You have to talk English. That's not the, way, that's not the right way to express yourself. Come on, talk like us. And yeah, then yeah. I to be like that. So it's a kind of a mixture, you know. And then uh, back to Norway, I've been living here. And it, it takes sometimes it's a long time between um, times I speak the language. English. So yeah. that's how it comes up like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a good mix. It's a good mix. So, so, uh, so, so what language do you speak with your mother? Uh, English. You speak English with your mother. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, because she never learned Norwegian very well, but, I see. uh, but, uh, you know, so I had to, I had to, uh, teach her the Norwegian language. I see. That's an inter that's an interesting dynamic when one is from another country other than Norway and then you come here and then you have kids and then the question comes up um always comes up of what to do about the language situation and some people make yeah. such a big deal about that uh yeah. for my wife and I my wife is Norwegian uh uh we've always had it like this from day 1 I speak only English to our children and I demand mm -hmm. that they speak English back to me. My wife speaks Norwegian to them, and they speak Norwegian back to her. And yes. then I speak only English with my wife. Yeah. And that's just always been the way it is. And there's and some people would say that that's a that's wrong. Those kids they're oh, in no. Norway. They should speak only Norwegian. Oh, I don't no. believe. I don't. I don't believe no. that. No, because uh, uh, people who say that are actually stupid. Because, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Because it's proven. It's proven that uh, kids that speak two languages do better in school yeah and they learn things faster do you think there's a little bit of xenophobia in that you know you you're you're um I, you know i can tell i can tell you how it is with me when i'm walking out in public with my wife and kids and i'm speaking english and they're all speaking english back to me and the dirty looks that i get especially from the older generation and mm -hmm. I can't understand why there would be any hostility from them other than xenophobia. Or at least a yeah. sense or at least a <laughs> sense of social superiority that they have. Social arrogance is what I like to call it. It's because they're soon gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> are you are you a stand up are you a stand up comedian? <laughs> that would piss anyone off. Yeah. If you know you pick up with the knowledge that if you're lucky, you have five to ten good years to live. I would be, I would be sour as well. <laughs> I've, I've, I've always wondered why there seems to be. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm going to criticize Norway here for a second, uh, uh, but but don't get me wrong. I enjoy living here. Everything is going fine, but I have to criticize something here. There seems to be this Norwegian fragility about their culture they are so um fearful they're so quick to express that they that they feel that their culture is threatened uh by uh by immigrants um and when norway is a country that has a relatively low percentage of immigrants here i don't mm -hmm. understand how they can feel threatened well i do Ex explain because that please 
the culture in Norway is very, um, it's, it, it's, 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 it's very small. The culture. Yeah, there's only and, a little over 5 million people here, but. Yes, the culture in Norway has been, um, has been uh, outwatered, if you want, um, for a long time, long before uh, people came here from other countries. And, and uh, I tell you what happened. The thing that happened was TV. Ah, American TV well, specifically. Norway, um, they did not have color TV. They had color TV in the United States when I, come to, when I came to Norway. But in Norway back then, people did not have TV. Not everyone had TV. And if they had, it was in black, white, black and white. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, uh, you know, uh, the radio came, BBC came with music from other countries. And uh, this, you know, the, the culture, the Norwegian culture is dying and has been dying for 40 years because they did not, like I said, they did not get their cultures in the school. I see. You see? They do not learn in school about their own culture. They that do goes not right learn back, that. yeah. That goes right no, back to what you were saying at the beginning. And that's too long ago. Nobody can relate to Vikings. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> you know? But where is the Norwegian music? Where is the, you know, everything? Where is the, the, the Norwegian way of living? What, what is typical Norwegian? When I ask Norwegian this, they cannot name anything. Very interesting. They say, they say like, well, what do you think about, uh, I tell them, what do you think about when I, when I say Norway? What's typical Norwegian? Well, the, you have the Norwegian flag. And I say, well, what is, every country has a flag. Yeah, yeah. But our flag is Norwegian. And I say, actually, it's kind of Chinese or, or, <laughs> or from Taiwan because that's where they make it. So, you know, even, even your boonard is made in China. Or Malaysia, China. China and Malaysia, yeah. Yes. So if they wanted to take care of their um, of the culture, they should, you know, kind of make sure that, like, at least the bunad was was made in Norway. So, so before they blame immigration uh, for erasing Norwegian culture, they first have to define Norwegian culture for themselves. It seems like yes. they're identifying with a concept, but not with something that is. Very concrete, but, but it's typical Norwegian. So I, I can say I, I can think about two things. Um, one is being um, uh, happy about snow, but then again, is that typical Norwegian? No, because they're also happy about snow in France, in Italy, yeah. in Canada, and yeah. you know. So, so there's very little that is just Norwegian. And, and, and it's a culture that's only in Norwegian. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, so, so. I can't think about anything. You're, you're getting extremely drunk. That's Norwegian. <laughs> that's Norwegian. But then again, Finnish people always like to drink <laughs> themselves <laughs> under the tables, you know. And, and th this is, uh, so is this... Uh, so, so, but they, 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 they spend so much time, or some Norwegians, there, there is a movement in Norway that spends a lot of time mm. in blaming uh, immigrants for erasing Norwegian culture. But the facts yes. say, again, let's go, let's go to facts. The facts say that 12, I think it's 12.8% of the Norwegian population is, is, uh, is populated by people who have a solely immigrant background. And yes. then of immigrants, 5.7% uh, of them are of a mixed immigrant and Norwegian background. That's, yes, not, a, that's, that's not, not a lot of people. It's a drop in no. the bucket in the population yeah. here. I, very I, little. I always challenge Norwegians to kind of like what you say, you know, they don't really know. They can't put their finger or they can't vocalize mm -hmm. what is Norwegian culture. What is this cultural no. thing that's being erased and how can you blame it on so few people? And if you blame it on this small percentage of the population in Norway, then are you not by default? claiming that the Norwegian culture is weak and meaningless. If so few people can erase it, that's not, that's, that doesn't speak to the strength of 
the Norwegian culture. Exactly. So that is what they have to first, first you have to define what Norwegian culture is. Yep. Step one. And, you know, that's step one. And, and, and they haven't gotten there yet. I just wonder if how much of that is because of xenophobia and how much of it is because they are just fearing progress. Because is it, is it not true that the change of any culture, whether it's Norwegian, American, whatever it may be, the change of any culture is, is, is p partly to blame, and I use blame very loosely, isn't it partly to blame on natural progress? People are yes, moving. Is. People are moving yes. all over the world to different oh. countries and whatnot, and that's going to change the the uh, culture. This, this has always been like this. You know, you, you 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 your parents, 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 parents will say that their children is going to go to hell because this is this world is. You know, they always say that. Always, always they have, yeah. Always have, and they always will. This generation gap will always be there. You know, because you you see young people today, <laughs> they not. They're not afraid of the change. No, they're not. You know, and I think it's, isn't it hilarious that the ones that you say, look at you dirty when you talk English and are so afraid of the Norwegian culture, they were the ones who fought uh, for freedom. They were the ones, they were the women who, who flung up their, their, their bras, their bras <laughs> and, I kinda... and listened to rock and roll and, and, and took the radio into the, into the field so the, so the parents wouldn't know and listened to Rolling Stones and Beatles and, yeah, and, and, yeah. and, 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 you know, the black music and yeah, yeah. that's the people who now is like, mm, I don't like foreigners. It's very, very weird it's very weird I, they have forgotten how, how, did they, how did they become these kind of people when, when, you know 40 years ago everything was like yeah peace and love. yeah yeah and you now know? that very and generation now, is the ones who are saying they can't stand foreigners they don't want immigration yeah. they want everything to go back the way it was while they look at their tvs and netflix oh. it's like so so oh. so you would like everything to go back the way it was, you know. How, how much? Know. How much do you identify with your American heritage? Um, not very much. <laughs> okay. Because I had this very strong um, aunt that was from Jamaica, who was this person who I really always asked. If I was wondering about, she told me about God and she told me about uh, all this stuff, the big questions and the little questions. And she was from, she was Jamaican. So I kind of feel more Jamaican than American. I see. Yeah. You know, have you ever, have uh, you ever been, have you ever been to Jamaica? No, but I am going next year. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, because every fourth year I have this what I call a walkabout. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that means I take a trip to a country I have never been before, far away, and I stay for a month. A month? Yes. So we're not, not talking. We're... It was uh, New Zealand. <laughs> wow. So we're not talking just a regular little vacation where you're going to look at the tourist spots. You're going to these countries, I would assume then, to actually dig deep and learn something. Yes. Very interesting. Because that's how I accept every kind of people, whatever their beliefs and whatever ethnicity and whatever age and whatever disability um, because uh, I know that people are people. Yeah. So the last time was New Zealand. Yes. And the previous time, where was it then? That was then. It was the United States of America. Where, where did you and go I in went, the states? For a month, I went to San Francisco, and uh, I just lived from hand to mouth. I did not bring a lot of money. I slept on beaches. Really. <laughs> I I'm kind it. of a crazy one, I know. <laughs> I sat down, and if somebody sat there with a guitar, I would sit down and sing with them, and and we would uh, you we would share the money yeah. that people throw to us and buy ourselves a uh, sandwich and uh, beer and just sit in the sun. Ah, best days of my life. And you were alone, or did you travel with anyone? Oh yeah, I like traveling alone because then you don't have to, you know. 
because if you bring someone they always want to do this and they always want to do that and some uh, uh, when i travel i just like to be out there and just sit and wait for something to happen that's beautiful yeah i just sit somewhere mm -hmm. and wait for mm -hmm. something to happen to see a person i want to go talk to or wait for someone to talk to me or wait for the rain or wait for did you ever have did you have any i'm sorry i didn't mean to interrupt go ahead go ahead oh, come on. no i was gonna say did you have any um scary experiences did you ever feel threatened in any situations when you're traveling alone no never never um never even looking never. in ret even looking in retrospect do you see now any situations that you experienced when traveling where you should have been afraid but you just weren't Oh, that's the story of my life. I'm surprised <laughs> I'm even alive. I'm surprised I'm alive. It's like, oh God, that could have gone very wrong. What were you thinking? So, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because I think when, when you mentioned traveling alone like that, I, th I think of my wife, uh, my beloved Snoopy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she... Snoopy? And, and you know why? It's because when I first met her, I've told this story so many times on my on my podcast. Yeah. But when I first met her, uh, my good friend Hagen Nielsen, a Norwegian woman, yeah. had moved to Chicago mm -hmm. to be with a good friend of mine, Ed Cohen. And yeah. I met Hagen and um, she started talking right away about this friend of hers that I needed to meet. And, and she was yeah. talking about my wife and this went on for a, a couple of years before I finally met my wife. So I was at the gym training with Hege and my wife walked in, uh, you know, straight off the plane from Norway and Hege yells mm -hmm. out in Norwegian. Hi, Snoopa. Snoopa. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I didn't know, and I didn't know, I didn't. And, and for those of you who don't speak Norwegian, Snoopa means like, like sweetheart or darling yes. or baby. She yes. says, hi, Snoopa. And I, yeah. I knew it was something in Norwegian, but me just being a silly person that I am, when I walked up to my wife, I said, hi, uh, uh, hi, my name is John. Nice to meet you, Snoopy. Oh and that's my God, that's so cute. And that's the first time I met her and she's been Snoopy ever since. <laughs> oh, that is so cute. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 back to what I was saying when when you talk about traveling alone like mm -hmm. that you know of course it, it, that can be very um, educational it can be quite exciting you can experience a lot but there's a certain element of um, if not nefarious uh, uh, um, possibilities at least a certain amount of danger or uncertainty and I think of my wife when she talked about traveling alone when she was maybe between the age of like nineteen and twenty twenty one. And she talks about getting off the at the bus station uh, in downtown Los Angeles with all these drug dealers, bums, gang members and stuff. And she's just, you know, this blonde haired uh, Norwegian woman with the long ponytail swinging behind her, walking around, talking to people. And I'm like, are you crazy? Uh -huh. You 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 know, she she and, and there's several little incidences like that that she experienced where I'm, I was just like. She, she she just she does doesn't know how close she was to danger where things could yeah, have gone wrong. Yeah, and I think I have been in those situations. But you know, I have a trick when I'm out yeah. alone. Yeah. Uh, I kind of just I start talking to myself out loud. <laughs> <laughs> so, so people think you're so, crazy, and people tend to leave crazy people alone. Well, that is a good deterrent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I thought, of, huh, yeah, I wasn't, was I supposed to go that way? No, I don't think so. Maybe it was there, there, I'm going, you know, I'm like that. And then people, they, they look, they look, you know, at me, uh, but yeah. they look <laughs> alone. No, well, there's a certain, I, I admire people who can travel alone. I, um, I guess, you know, here I am, I'm doing this podcast. I'm also a musician. I get on stage mm -hmm. and do stand-up comedy. But underneath all of that is this introvert. I'm, 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 uh, I guess I would describe myself as shy. And within that description is also a man who would not ever travel by himself. There would be mm -hmm. a certain amount of anxiety or a certain amount of, of uh, intimidation in that for me. So I always admire people who can travel alone and, and just... Yeah. just with a few dollars in their pocket, uh, mm -hmm. land land in a, a foreign country they've never been in before, and just start looking around. Yes, 
and you know it does something to um i understand about being an introvert because a lot of uh, a lot of artists actually don't like people <laughs> <laughs> well i like people i like people uh, i just yes. sometimes i find it difficult to find my place among people here i am yes. I'm, I'm burying my soul yeah. by saying this but i find i find some challenges in finding my place among people yeah. and, i can understand that and i'm also like, you know, have you ever been to a party and you kind of it's a lot of people and everybody's talking and everybody's dancing and everybody's having fun but you're kind of just watching you standing in the corner and thinking what the <laughs> about. Well, I haven't been. First of all, first of all, I haven't been to a party in twenty five years. So that says a little bit about my. <laughs> that says a little bit about my level of introvert. Well, you no, know, you're not missing out. Nothing happens. <laughs> <laughs> no, in, in all in all seriousness, I'm not I'm not I'm not the the I'm not the party person. I'm not the uh, I don't need to go to a club pub or or uh, you know any anything like that uh, other than to perform. And yeah, then right. and then I I can socialize with people after a performance, but very soon after that performance, I feel the need to 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 pull myself out of that focal point. Yeah and go back home <laughs> yes yes go back but, home uh, I, I feel the same i i'm, I'm exactly the same I, I never stay for long i always think about uh, um, um, you know um most of the time i get bored after 10 minutes i wonder if i wonder if people i i think of this from time to time but it, it just popped in my head to ask this rhetorical question now uh i wonder what people think of it when because i can think to the last time i did stand up for example, in Oslo, mm -hmm. uh, I went up, I did my act, I got off and there was a bunch of positive feedback. I met some new friends. I met, I ran into an old student of mine. I used to be a teacher, ran into an mm -hmm. old student of mine who's now an adult. Um, there were some people who I only knew from social media who were there. And I, I hung around for maybe five minutes and then I just left. I didn't say goodbye to anybody. I just left. <laughs> That's the way. I, and, and, and I, I, I kind of shove all thoughts of <laughs> that whole process away from me consistently, yeah. but sometimes I stop and think, why, why do I do that? I feel, I, I, I just, all of a sudden I feel the need to just get out of there and, and it's weird and awkward to say goodbye. Mm -hmm. I just have to leave. I just walk away. I'm gone. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the same. I'm the same. Actually. I kind of, sometimes I just say, well, I'm going to go to the loo. <laughs> You, well, 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 you know what I did uh, at the last time at that at that uh, at that stand up show. My my wife Snoopy called me actually. Yeah. So I made a big show of it. You know, it wasn't a fake phone call. She really did call me, but I made a big show of answering it. And I start talking with her, and I I put up like the the index finger, like hold on, everybody. And I walked out and took this call, and I just kept walking. <laughs> I've never seen again. <laughs> Isn't that awful? Oh my gosh, I have issues. I have social issues, people. I think my next guest needs to be a psychologist. I need to talk through this. Oh, that, that would be interesting. You should talk about um, if you if you have uh, uh, a psychologist in your show. Yeah. You should ask him this question because this yeah. is something I always wondered about. Yeah. Why do people feel the need to hate that's a good you, you hear the silence that is a good question that starts me to thinking immediately um and that's also something i wonder about yes. i i believe that it is entirely possible to have a heated discussion with someone whom you with whom you have no no inkling of agreement with you can be polar opposites on an issue you can disagree to the nth degree yeah but still feel warmth love and maybe even admiration for that person yeah but the tendency is to feel anger and hatred yes. for that person who doesn't share your thoughts and why, why, and why, why is that we need we need to see a new way to discuss it because i have i actually have friends who believe in god i don't believe in god but we have no issues about that well i've, I've 
we're friends, we talk about everything, we respect each other, it doesn't affect our friendship. Exactly. And, and I've said this so many times before. I, you know, you'll, you'll hear people say, well, one thing you don't talk about, if you don't want to ruin a friendship, do not talk about politics or religion. And I just don't agree with that. Why, no, why, you know, and again, I'm a Christian. <clears throat> I, I was raised in the church, but I couldn't, th I could never imagine hating someone or belittling someone or, or, or trying to, to, trying to impress my views upon someone who doesn't yeah. share my religious views. Uh, and, and, and I believe that discussion about those things, regardless of one's standpoint on religion or politics i believe that the discussion can be very fruitful you can always learn yes, something from a discussion like that and it does yes, not dictate i'm sorry yes you can learn something yeah, and that yeah. is that is the meaning of life people say what's the meaning of life learning something <laughs> learn <laughs> get wiser learn something because if you learn everything there is to learn you won't be so afraid of dying and you won't get so grumpy you know one thing i see is that a lot of people who are atheists or a lot of people who who, who think bad on religion they don't know anybody who's religious they kind of look at the stereotypic extreme you know the the the, the fire and brimstone evangelist they kind of look at that yes. and yes. use that as their barometer uh, when it comes to what's right and what's wrong about religion. Well, yeah, I, you know, as a Christian, I agree with you that fire and brimstone mm -hmm. evangelist who tells, who, who, who preaches that is, if you don't believe as I do, you're going to hell. I don't agree with that guy either. So yeah. how about that? You know, so, so, so in the course of a discussion about religion, an atheist would then be able to learn an atheist or a non-believer would then be able to learn that, oh yeah, well, not all Christians are like that. Yeah. But you know, um, I've discussed this with my with my um, with my Christian friend, and I said, and uh, I told them, um, why is it that if you're not Christian, if you don't believe in any um, religion, that you have to be an atheist? <laughs> where, does, where, where does that come from? It's very interesting. Yeah. It's very interesting. Yes. Yeah. Is it because you don't believe in God, you can't believe in anything? Exactly. That, that, that's kind of peculiar. <laughs> I, do believe in, I do believe in myself. I do believe in people. I do believe in nature. I do believe that we are not alone in this world. I do believe that uh, somewhere out there in this great universe of many planets, there has to be intelligent life. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because, because it's logical yeah and i don't believe that 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 being religious cancels out logic <laughs> you know because i can, as a as a religious man as one who was brought up in the christian church i can also agree with what you just said that we we can't mm -hmm. it, it doesn't make sense that we would be mm -hmm. the only intelligent life no it doesn't make sense that that, that would be the it case it doesn't make sense at all because the room is too big you know exactly it, it's like if you see oh, oh, oh if, if you see one ant in a big room there will be more ants. Absolutely. You know, so, and, and I think uh, that's what I believe. And even if, I think that if you do, uh, you know, I also are, um, when I came to Norway, the, the, everything was Christian, you know, uh, so it, it was, it was, well, that's a part of, uh, of uh, what's typical Norwegian. Well, before, before the 80s, Everybody was Christian. Everybody went to church. Everybody, uh, uh, nobody thought of that it was strange uh, talking loud, out loud about God and Jesus. Yeah, and, yeah, you know, it was, kind yeah. of, it was kind of natural in the society, you yeah. know. And I came also from a um, Catholic family in, in New York where, where everybody went to church uh, and prayed every, before they had their meals, they would pray. Yeah. And, and stuff like that. And I came, I remember I, I, I visited um, my family in New York when I was 10 years old, about 10 years old, w w with my mom and my sister. And I saw my whole family and they never actually met me uh, since I was two years old, since I moved to Norway. And they, well, and I thought it was going to be so great to be somewhere where I wouldn't, you know, stick out like a sort of thumb. 
because I did at Oscar <laughs> being born, you know. So I thought it was going to be really great to come to New York and be with my own people. Nobody would point at me. Nobody would think that I was strange. Yeah. And everything was going great until um, one day we were sitting down and we was going to, you know, uh, pray for, for for the food and stuff. And I said, well, you know, I don't believe in God. Ah. Oh, oh. Uh, uh, oh, it was like, tension in the air. Yeah. And my whole family, you know, they would stare at this devil child, you yeah, know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I talked to my aunt about it later, and she said, Don't mind, child. She said, uh, It does not matter if you don't believe in God because he believes in you. And when he has use for you, he will call on you. You just take it easy and go on with your own business. That sounds like that sounds like something my grandmother would say. Yeah. So I did, and that's what I think now that I am um, that I have you know scratched everything that has to do with religion out of my life. I think that if it is a god and he or she is almighty, they will call on me. I don't have to bother. No, it'll come. It'll come if it comes I when it comes. Just, just be nice to people. And do my thing, and learn, and get wiser. <clears throat> and, I, and I think that is the most important thing, whether one uh, places that under religion or under just being a good person, is that one must just be a good person and spread love. And that's, anybody can do that. Yes. Yeah. And it's free. And <laughs> it's free. It should mm -hmm. be. It should be anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Let me let me ask you this. What's what's coming up for you? Do you have any plans for the near or far future? Uh, I am uh, well for the far future. As I said, I'm traveling to uh, Jamaica next year, and I have to plan it because I'm going alone and I have to stay away for a month. So I have to plan it, and uh, that takes maybe two or three months to plan where you're going to live, where you can live. Uh, make sure that you, if you lose your passport or somebody knocks your uh, on your head and something uh, you have to be able to know where the embassy is and where you can go to get help and stuff like that and also you know uh, get some connections get to know people over the nets that are in jamaica say i'm coming can you please help me yeah yeah so that's what i'm gonna do and in the near future i'm writing a book about my um what it was like to to um to uh come to Oscar outside bergen in 1966 66, 68 it was as a little black girl from new from new york interesting um, how far yes, along how, how far along on that book project are you well it's done it's coming ah. out in november aha mm -hmm. uh -huh. who is the publisher are you self-publishing or did you get yeah, a deal it's called time uh, for love interesting <clears throat> now yeah. as a, as an aspiring writer myself i have uh I have something in the works, <laughs> uh, far from completion. <laughs> but I just want—I just want to ask you, as a, as a fellow writer, how yes. did did you write the book and then seek a publisher, or did the publisher know you, about you because of your your visibility as a as an artist, and then they approached you for a deal? How did how did that happen? I thought it was a mix. I wrote this book for a year ago. And uh, then I sent a kind of, uh, of you know, um, a, a, a little part of the script to um, to publishers. You sent you sent like an excerpt of of the book to the to yes. a publisher. Okay. And then I told them about myself. I sent a picture of myself, and uh, told them that I hope you want to that you are interested in this project how big and was the uh, how big was the excerpt how many how many pages it was about one page okay it was like the first chapter okay so you send them you send them the first chapter about a page uh yeah. you tell them about yourself and then you ask them if they would be interested in in, in publishing that yeah how long until they said yes or did um, they, did, this publisher said yes in two weeks. Wow. 
So in two someone, I got answers from, I sent to six publishers and I got answers from three. Okay. And two of them said this was interesting, but now we don't have uh, the time to do this. And you can come back to us later if you want. And then one said yes. And these were all Norwegian publishers. Yes. Interesting. So I took the deal and uh, now I'm coming up with my book and now I'm writing also a child's book. Ah, how cool is that? To see if I can get that uh, published as well. And, and what is the name of the book that's coming out? Uh, it's called uh, uh, Dan Förste. Dan Förste, the first, as that would be in English, yeah. First. yeah. And then, uh, when, when, would you, when did you say that book is coming out? November, but the date is not set yet. Oh yeah, November 2020. Yes. Okay. This November. Okay. Well, I, I wanna, I, I'm, I wanna help people, uh, help people find. I have, I have two or three listeners, and I want all two or three of them to buy your book. So, yes, get, get that. Get, you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like I always say: if no one, you know, if if I don't promote myself, who's going to do it? So I right. am, a, I am a proponent of putting that yes. information out there, what I'm doing, and and where people can find it or or join in yes. on it. We can't be afraid to promote yeah. ourselves. Yes, and that's kind of stupid. It's like it's like you're not allowed to say that. Well, you know, I'm a good singer, or I'm a good actor, or I'm a good uh, I'm a good artist. I'm 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 good. I've done this. I'm done this. That's not allowed to said uh, to say. But you know, if if you're a plumber or or a teacher, you have to say that you're good. You can't say, well, I'm a teacher, but I'm not very good. Who's gonna hire you? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I always say, as as a songwriter, I always say that I'm the best songwriter that I know of. When I write a song and I put it on my project or if I give it to, uh, to, to another artist or, an, or mm. another band, I have to be confident that that song is the best I could do. Otherwise, yes. why, would I, otherwise why, would I, why would I put it out there? Yeah, I, don't think that, yeah, I don't think there's any arrogance in saying that because as, as you say, a plumber or a car mechanic, they're going to say they're good at their job. That's why yeah. they want you to, to hire them to do the work. So. They're not gonna. Uh, at least they're not gonna say, "Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I, I'll make my best." Well, you know, there's probably people out there that are better, than, but I'm gonna do my best. They will not say that. But you know? I. But yeah. I will join you in, in, in promoting. You know, you're you're self promoting, but I will also promote you. I know. Um, I can I can tell you. I can go. We can go back to the first night I met you. Uh, you were going into the studio at, uh, at, at Procom, shout out to Procom, the local, uh, music, yeah. local music store here. You were going in there to, to put on the, uh, I don't even want to say background lyrics because you sang the lead on a verse or two, and then you were background on some of the chorus and, and whatnot. Uh, beautiful performance, beautiful song written by, uh, Ula Ask, a Norwegian yeah. artist. Um, yes. shout out to Ula. yeah, hi Ula. Um, hi, Ula. So I know, I know that you are the real deal. I know you can sing. <laughs> and, yes, and, I can sing. And I've, I, I've, I've been present for a lot of recordings, you know, as a, as a lyricist and as a, uh, an, an English vocal coach for a lot of Norwegian uh, yes. performances. And I have never seen anyone walk into a vocal booth with the confidence that you had. It was impressive. <laughs> you knew that this, 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 this session was going to go well, and, uh, and and you knew you were going to be able to produce a vocal that would be proper for that song. I could just see the yeah. confidence. It was beautiful. Because it's my work. I know my work. Like a good plumber. <laughs> like a good plumber. I know my work. I know I've done this before, and uh, I know how this goes. I know this is this is the part that goes into that part. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the, the, are you as confident with your book writing as you are with your acting and singing? Yes. So you know you're, you're confident that this book is going to be something that people are going to yeah, latch on to. Because nobody can write this story better than me. It, there you go. It's your story. Yeah. It's my story. Who can write it better? Nobody. How long did it take you to write it? it took me a year. How, did did you have a? It was a difficult process. Why? Because when you um, 
when you write a book about yourself, you have to go back in time and remember all the bad things, all the things that made you cry, all the things that made you laugh, all, 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 the, all, all the things that, all, all the people that, that were mean, or the people who were extremely good, and everything makes you cry. Sure. It's an you emotional, know? it's an emotional process. Yes, you have to go in this bubble when I was younger, when I was the, the, the before me. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm different now. I've grown, not only in, in, in years, but in, in, in my way of seeing the world, my way I'm better at being me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Me? So, so I would imagine then that during this process, as you say, you're, 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 you're bringing forth, uh, memories, both good and bad. Um, and you're putting it on, on paper in, in black and white. How did that affect your daily life at that moment during that writing process? Well, uh, some days I were pretty sad and upset because I thought that oh my God, it's so long ago and still <clears throat> a lot of things haven't changed. And that kind of upset me. But then other days I would see this has changed and this has changed, this has been better, maybe because of me. Aha, uh -huh. yeah. Maybe. And I think that um, I, I really understood how important it is to be a good pioneer. Uh, even if you don't want to. When I was, uh, I, I, I played um, um, the fairy Tingling. In, yeah, um, Tinkerbell, as it's called in English. Tinkerbell in Bergen uh, last year. And, you know, that, uh, that was a great thing. You know, they, they, they put me up in, in, in this uh, pink tutu and my hair is standing I up. saw that. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and I was I was a great Tinkerbell, <laughs> and you know I used to um, after I I have done my part and 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 the public was leaving I would I would run out in my costume to to meet the children. Ah, oh. that was the greatest thing about it, yeah, you know, because yeah, yeah. I'm a problem. They have to see me. They have to touch me. They have yeah. to hear me too. You know, I wanted to make a change because that is the change. I wanted to be the person I wanted to have when I was a kid. I did not have anybody to look up to. I did not have anybody that looked like me. No, no. So, and, 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 and every child needs someone to brighten up their day. Absolutely. Even uh, regardless of what color of the skin, but especially if you are black and you are growing up in a white community, you need to see that, oh, well, if she makes it, so, so can, can I. I. Yeah. And, and children need to know that. I always, uh, I always told, tell children that you only need one friend. You don't need to be popular. You need one friend that give you the real love and that you love back for real. Yeah. And if you want that, you can be or become whatever, whoever you want. See, and you, can work about, you can do this. And I came to these kids, and I saw all these kids, uh, regardless of of of, uh, of ethnicity, they came to me. You know, you know, like like bees. Yeah, yeah. And they were, oh, can I take a picture with you? Oh, hello, take a bath. And I was, oh, I'm doing something important here. This is why I'm here. That's beautiful. See, no. see, and that's that's the kind of message that I. Um, this is this is why I choose the guests that I have because I want people to understand that there is. There's a lot of there's a lot of messages out there, and the message that you're t giving now is about this message of sharing, this message of about being meaningful for people other than yourself. Yes. About making a difference in the lives of others. Yes, it, and it, it, it gave me such a feeling. You know, I would I would go up there and I would touch these little kids and the parents would take pictures of me with them. And in thousands and thousands of Norwegian homes, 
they have a picture of you, yeah, of me, smiling, making a difference for their child in that moment. Down that life is good. Come on, you can do it. Yeah, I make a difference. That is, uh... and that really made me understand that. Okay, this book, I have to do this. I have to do this. Well, I, I hope people read it. I'm going to read it. And I tell you, yes, and it's, an, so. it's an inspiration for me as a writer. I've begun and stopped and begun and stopped and begun again my writing project. Because, what do you write about? Well, <clears throat> I'm, I'm trying to tell my story. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to tell my story going back uh, to what I experienced, what I went through, and how I became who I am today. Basically... Mm -hmm. The same type of story that you're written, only the character is me instead of you. So it is, it's, yeah. that, it's that same process of going back and telling those stories of the things that affected me. And I've always stopped. For years I've been doing this. I bet you I've been starting and stopping for the last 12 years, maybe. <laughs> oh, but why do you stop? Um... There, I have, ex I, I have felt that there has been the, 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 the burden of rehashing those old traumatic or disappointing memories was, was too much. I've shoved them away, right. and in order to write about it, I have to pull them back in again. I can relate. That was the problem when I was writing as well, but that was also but what see, put pushed it forward i see and told me you have to get this done or you will think about this and you will relive this uh, thing again and again and again yeah. and you know the strange thing happens i kid you not when i wrote it and it was done i was done with the past yeah, yeah. you see how it works yep yep i was done with the bad stuff i think okay now i've done this now it's time for a new chapter in my life. There you go. Well, see, and I've dealt with I've dealt with all of that stuff, but only in microscopic ways, if you will. Um, yeah. A lot, a lot of the songs I've written, both for my own project and for others, have elements of those issues in them. But yeah. it's just a micro. It's just it's just the tiniest little speck of the issue that goes into that song, and then yeah, I shove I the issue away again. Mm -hmm. and whereas the, the, this effort to write it out in a book will be a complete, um, I don't know, a, a complete treatment, if you will, of that prior illness, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. And it's been a challenge. You know, you, you were able to get through that writing project in a year. I haven't gotten through my writing in 12 years. Yeah, I understand. But, you know, sometimes uh, it's like it's like a record. Somebody... Somebody writes the songs uh, of a record in half a year, and somebody can't do it uh, until they have, you know, like they yeah. use 10 years, yeah. like one record. Yeah. People are different, and people process things differently. Yeah. But having yeah. said that, I, I have made the decision. Um, my, my son, I don't know if you knew this, my son died uh, of a heroin overdose. Yes. 5th, of, 5th, so. 5th of November tw uh, 2019. And since then, I have decided that I'm not going to stop this time when I write my story. I'm going to mm -hmm. write it and, I, and I'm going to get it out. No more delays. No more shoving things aside. Things are going to be dealt with now. Um, and, and I think that, you know, it's so, I'm so sorry about your son, but I think especially that is something that people need to hear. I think so. I have, I have very consciously chosen to talk openly about it. I've seen already that me talking about it has helped other people in, in the same situation or in a similar situation. Uh, and and the whole, the whole focus is on dealing with, the issues that are placed before us. Sometimes yes. you just cannot avoid trauma. So then the question yes. becomes, how do you deal with it? Yes. Yeah. And it is, you know, with writing, um, I took one part of my life and decided to write about that. It's not like my whole life is in that book. It's what I felt and who I was from, I came to right. Norway until I was about 18 years old. Yeah. 
you know, uh, and, 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 and the issue of trying to finding my place in a community in the world. And, yeah. you know, the, the, the when I was a youngster, after 18, I have a different story. Yeah. Yeah. And I have chosen chosen to write about that yet. And that's and that's also uh, one thing that I've decided since my son's death is that you know I don't have to write my 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 writing does not have to encompass my entire life. I can take a section no. of my life and write about that first. Yes. So that I have de- so 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 I have decided to do that to do that, and now I see that the process is much easier because I have compartmentalized it. Yeah. And made it I'm, easier to tackle. It's a smaller package. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, that is the way to do it because yeah. then you can, you know, and it's easier also for people to pick up on what you are dealing with. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, it's because if it's too much, is you know, it, it's like this big dinner table with 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 twenty courses. You know, it's yeah. easier if it's only six courses exactly. there. Exactly. You know, so I think it's good, and 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 in no way people need to know stuff about um, uh, how it is to be a father of a son that died. Yep. Because people actually uh, live those horrific things. They, uh, this is reality. I have. I, yeah. I guess it, the- help someone to express. The feelings to express their sorrow and 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 their grief yeah. and and you will help someone. There will be there will be something therapeutic for myself in that writing process. But yes, I I hope also uh, that it will help others. It's it's kind of like this podcast. This the, I started doing this podcast uh, because of the death of my son, and I look at this as an aspect in me dealing with that. Uh, you know, this yeah. search for for the teaching moments in the lives of others. That's what I'm looking for when mm-hmm. I choose my guests for the podcast. There's something about them that is a teaching moment for me, which I then hope can be a teaching moment for others. Uh, I'm a proponent of making oneself as solid and as strong as possible, whether it's physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Uh, be as strong as possible so that you are then better equipped to help others. Help yourself yes. to get stronger so that you can then help others to be stronger. So that that is the whole foundation of my podcast. That is yeah. the whole... That's right. I, I, yeah. I understand that this is... Uh, and I, I can hear the way you talk about it, that this is important for you. Absolutely, it is. And that you, and, and that you are serious. Of it. And you know... It's it's kind of you know this with um, uh, everything that has to do with um, with the bad things in society like drugs, yeah, and people dying from overdoses and this people don't talk about it, yeah, it's you know because because it's too painful and it's too you know it's too painful it's too shameful, so oh, only that is is actually uh, um, proof of that you need to talk about it we need to talk about it yeah. Absolutely. We need to talk about it because even though it's not it's 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 not comfortable, but well, I feel I, I feel uh, I feel a strong need to speak on it, um, both for my own therapeutic benefit, but also for the benefit potentially for the benefit of others. Um, I'm just trying to deal with my thing so that I can be better equipped to help others. Absolutely, mm-hmm. that's that's the whole purpose of it. Um, yeah. One last thing I want to ask you about uh, about the writing process. As you yeah. see, as you see now, I'm distancing myself from emotions because I'm, uh, <laughs> that's, it's hard, it's hard to talk about this stuff with my son and all that, but I need to talk about it. Uh, yes. but now, I see. but now moving, moving on or moving back moving rather on. to, to the writing process. Why did you choose to go to a publisher instead of self publishing? Because self publishing is the thing now, you know, people will write mm-hmm. their book and then they'll hire in a graphic designer to make the cover. And then they'll go the Kindle route or the you know the Amazon route and 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 uh, basically print on demand, and they keep a larger portion of the profits for themselves. They have more control of the project. What made you not choose that but go with a traditional publisher? Well, because, because you seem because you seem to be the person who likes as much control as possible over your your artistic expression. I I did this for a reason. Yeah. 
Because if you look at, uh, if you go into all the big uh, publishers in Norway, they only have uh, white writers. I, 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 I love you, Miss Kim. I'm so glad you're saying this. Yeah, oh, speak I, on it, please. It says Forfattere, writers, and you click on Forfattere, and it's pictures of, of all their writers. Yes. And they're not a black white. face, not a black or brown face among them. Okay. I need to teach these guys something. <laughs> there well, I am. Well, see, now here, here's, here's something I've been thinking on because that's been an issue with me as well. Um, I don't see that concentrated social movement, if you will, focusing on the issues of black men and women in Norway. I just don't see it. We are not represented socially. We're not represented politically. Um, there are no black politicians. There's some brown politicians, but no black politicians in Norway. And as you say, there's no black writers. Um, what would you say to an aspiring author parentheses me <laughs> who who is 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 writing a project but i am writing my project in english with yeah. the thought of reaching a wider audience am i missing out on an opportunity to put some focus on the issue of the lack of representation for black authors in norway yes <gasps> oh yes so you, uh, okay. So because, I, um, you need to, uh, you need to because you know you are in the position to be a pioneer. That's true. It it doesn't it it, it it it's really not important if you want to be or if you like it. You can. Exactly. And you are one of the few people who actually can. You think I can? Why? Oh, because you uh, you can write, and uh, uh, um, you do this. You talk to people, and uh, you, you got your mindset that you are going to write this. Yeah. This 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 is happening. I've already started it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the only thing is to publish it, and you should publish it so that everybody could read it, and so that you can, they can understand that. See, it doesn't yeah. matter what color of skin you have. You can do this, this. yeah. Can relate to this. And then you widen the aspect and you widen how white Norwegians look at black Norwegians. So you would you, so you would suggest then that I write this book uh, in Norwegian and let it have the effect that it has or doesn't have, and then possibly republish an English version that can then be released yes. to the outside world. But start oh, first yeah. here in Norway and, and, and make that statement. Yes, because um, um, getting in, uh, you know, uh, in in English is not going to be a problem. That's true. When it's first published, it's not going to be a problem. So in other words, a lot of books that are really popular are, are published in all kinds of languages. That's true. That's true. That's what they do when it's a success, you know. So that's true. I would do that because you can, and because we need more pioneers. Um, um, the reason why there are no black politicians, why there are no uh, black uh, 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 authors in, in, in published office, and it's because they don't have enough people like you and me. People, because people don't want to step out and, and be seen and say, hello, yeah. I want to say this, yeah. and you have to listen. Yeah. People don't want to do that. Exactly. And I'm definitely not afraid of doing that. Like, you know, as you see, I do this podcast, you know, I'm not afraid to, I'm not afraid to get on, uh, uh, which by the way, was one of the greatest experiences I've ever had was being on, t on TV on, uh, the, uh, good morning, Norway. Good morning, Norge. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. And th I have to say something about that, about, <clears throat> about being on, on good morning, Norway or good morning, Norge, as it's called here in Norway. Um, mm -hmm. It's it, there's kind of a two two sided effect or a two or a double sided feeling that I have about that. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people are giving me feedback, and it's almost as if they are surprised 
that a black man was able to get on that television show nationally televised Mm -hmm. and speak intelligently. It's almost like they've never seen that before. And they're surprised that a black man could do it. There's something uplift. That's that's why you have to do this. Exactly. Exactly. We are making it normal. Yeah. I wish, I wish I wasn't the only one in recent memory who has done that. I wish there were more before me. See, now you understand why. Exactly. I did with the author that I, I don't, I didn't want to, I, I want to publish it. This is why. I knew, I, I told you this. I knew when I first met you, um, uh, we both got to uh, Procom. Uh, they weren't, the door wasn't even open, if you remember, and we sat at that restaurant and just hung out and talked for a few minutes. And I, and I, felt, I felt that there was some common threads that you and I share. And I see now through this conversation that I was, I'm correct. You and I are yeah. so like-minded, both in our life experience, but also in our vision for what is to come. Yes. Yeah. And you have to have a vision and you have to, you cannot be afraid, you know, because people say to me often that, oh, you're so this and you're so that, oh, you're so good at not acting and you're so good at singer, you know, my real talent is that I'm bold. You're fearless. That is my talent. Yeah, yeah. Because all of these things, the singing, the writing, the dancing, the acting would not matter if I wasn't fearless. Well, it's an admirable characteristic for, for anyone, for anyone to have. Um, and, and, and you display your fearlessness. I mean, it's, it's, and and when I say you display it, it's not like you're trying to, to be something you're not, there's nothing fake in your display. You are just being yourself. And that, and that radiation just, it, it just radiates from you, the confidence the, the 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 vision and the fearlessness and i think it's something to be admired i admire it oh thank you but you know yeah you know i have been thinking that, i want i want to um, be like you when i grow up <laughs> yeah you know <laughs> i was just thinking that what what hasn't killed me yet <laughs> you know um, yeah. i mean there's not there's not a lot to be afraid of now yeah because, you know, I have done it all, you know. I, That's the way I look, I, yeah. That's the way I, I'm looking I, at it. I did this. I came to this country. I was alone. I, I, I went to school and I, I, I was kind of bright, but in a threatening way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, everything that I have endured makes me more unafraid now than I, uh, because now I said, there's nothing. Now it's kind of the only thing I fear now is death. Well, you know, I, I, I look at it like this after everything I've seen, everything I've done after everything that's been done to me, uh, Hmm. (laughs) to, uh, to be read later in my book. Um, after all of that, you know, I, I, I'm also fearless. I, I, put myself in that fearless category. I can be at times uncertain, but that uncertainty is just a challenge. And when I, when I, when I take up that challenge, that's just an opportunity to be, uh, that's just an opportunity for self-development as I work through that challenge. But there is no fear. I cannot not do what I think is right. The, 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 a, a side effect of that is that one misses friends along the way. Um, And one thing that is sad, uh, but 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 very visible, and and it's something that I that I think on, is that I have lost some friends since I've started doing this podcast. Um, the episode that got me that that uh, televised interview on Good Morning Norway, episode twenty eight of my podcast, where I spoke quite openly about the uh, social and racial unrest back home in the States. There's some people who heard that and they found something threatening about that. Oh my gosh, John is, he's being black. (laughs) He's, he's, you know, he's addressing this issue and, and people have distanced themselves, not only distanced themselves, but just cut off the friendship ever since that episode. And it's very interesting. 
that is the thing because you know when you're young being fearless is a good thing uh and then when you grow up you are supposed to do as you're told and being fearless is stupidness yeah you see yeah. that is why this is happening and this is why um when you're grown up and you're fearless you're different mm -hmm. because you know it's, it's it's part of who you are and i i, I always did ask questions about everything I, I questioned everything and i still do i cannot stand grown-up men or women women past 50 uh, uh, um, acting like they know it all <laughs> yeah yeah acting like they have all the answers just because they live that long you don't have all the answers no no why are you pretending and why are you why are you making me feel stupid because i'm asking what's that mm. and then you make me feel stupid but you don't know what it is uh -huh. oh, yeah. you just pretend you know it you yeah. see yeah. so being fearless when you are grown up is not a good thing people don't like it because then you are supposed to do uh what you you're told and be successful and there is only one way to be successful in not only Norway, but in the Western world, it's to have a good education, have a good job, good paid job, get your house, get your two kids and a dog and a station wagon and a boat and go to Spain when you're, uh, when you retire. Yeah. There's, there's one way, you know, all these other ways to live a successful life, nobody talks about. No, they don't. I don't have these things. I'm not interested in that. No. But I have a full life. Yeah. Yeah. I am a success. Even if I don't have a dog and a station wagon yeah. and, and, and a house in the country, I yeah. don't have that. Don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, because that's not my picture of being a success. Right. Right. And you never you know, feel, you never feel tempted to fall into that traditional life. No, I no. did when I was in my thirties. Oh. I tried to be. I tried to be normal. I got married, got my two kids, uh, started the planning of building my own house with my husband, and uh, and then and then um, and then uh, the marriage didn't work out. And then I sat down and I thought, why are you doing this? Why are you pretending to be someone else? Is that you why? Two kids. And that's all you need. Now you're done with the so-called normal life. Go and do what you told yourself you was going to do. Was it your and desire? It. Was it your desire to live your 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 true life? Is that what led to the divorce, or is that what led to the marriage not working? Yes, I see. It actually was. It was part of it. It was not the only the only thing, that, but it was part of it. I see. Because I did not, you know, uh, uh, you know, you always think of when, whatever reason, when you divorce, you always think that there is something wrong with your partner. Well, he did this and he did that and he did this, and 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 and, and I and I did I did fall into the trap. I thought, yes, it's because he did this and he did that and he was so and he was so and yes, that's not untrue, but also, I never thought about what I was putting in. Ah, uh, yeah. I was an excellent mother. But to this day, I am not sure that I was an excellent partner. I see. You see? That's because a heck of a display of introspection because not a lot of people would ask themselves that question. Myself, yes, I never asked myself, what am I for him? Yeah. Because I was so preoccupied about, oh, what is he? He doesn't do this for me. He doesn't do this for me. He's not like that. Why doesn't he see that I'm, I've got my period? Why doesn't he know that I'm not <laughs> like that? You know, all this. Uh, and, and <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, I and do. Then, and afterwards, I, I, I understood that we were not right for each other. But then I was not right for... Um, for to being a partner i had nothing to give as a partner no that is a heck of an admission a lot there's not many people who would who would admit that 
Yeah, I, I got very sad because in my mind it made me a bad person. I see. Okay. You're not a partner. You're not partner material. I see. It made me sad for a long time. Yeah. And then I thought... Um, well, a lot of... Will, it, it, it will work out, but, but I'm... And I'm still not your typical partner material. No. And now I understand that is okay as long as I don't go into a partnership not knowing about it. I do believe that people can be too immature to be in a relationship, and that is regardless of how old they are. A person yes. cannot be developed enough personally to be in a relationship. Yes. There's nothing bad about that, but I no. think it is a I think it is a uh, a very real condition that one can find oneself in. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah, and so that and that is why also I think my my relationships seem to seem to last like about four years, and okay. then it's over. So there's a cycle think, to it then. <laughs> yes, and I think it's because people easily fall in love with me. And they stay in love for a long time. And then, but the real love, you know, the real love doesn't, doesn't come into the picture. I see. Because oh, we lost your sound. We lost your sound. Um, no, do you hear me? Okay, you can hear me, but I cannot hear you. Your sound is gone. Maybe I should hang up and call you back. No editing either. Let me hang up and I'll call you right back. Let's try this. Wow, people, this was interesting. It is what it is, though. Let's see if we can get Miss Kim Fairchild back. Calling her up again. There you are. Can you hear me? Now I can hear you, yes. <laughs> hey, this podcast is what it is, you know. We 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 <laughs> we, we, we we record it all. <laughs> well, well, that's fun. Um I don't know. I, I I forget what we were talking about, but this whole thing with relationships is is um it's very individual. You know, what people, what one person will find attractive in a relationship can be a big burden for another. And then it's hard to get those things to match after that initial honeymoon phase, if yeah. you will. And then uh, for a lot of couples, when things start to go bad, they try to hang on, they try to fix the other person. They try mm -hmm. to do that repair work on a machine that cannot be repaired. And then that just leads yes. to more... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I believe you should try and work on things, but if it's not working, it's not working, and then what are you going to do? Yeah, you know, it's it's better to be alone than in a bad relationship. Totally agree. Absolutely. I think. And then it's the will to be in a relationship. Right now, I don't have the will to be in a relationship, but I've, I think um, uh, I just need someone to find me. I see. Well, they will. That will happen. I mean, you are, you are too dynamic of a personality for people not to, uh, you know, uh, eventually somebody's going to find. That's, that's part of the problem, you know? <laughs> well, I can, I can very easily see, and I don't want this to sound like any, anything uh, 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 negative at all uh, or, or critical, but you do have a very, um, I don't want to say a bubbly personality. That sounds so stupid. You have a very, you have a strong personality. You, you, you speak, mm -hmm. you speak with meaning, you speak with strength and that can be intimidating for a lot of men. Yes. And it is because especially it's intimidating for men, uh, at my age. Yes. Because they are not used to people, uh, to, to women speaking up. Exactly. You know, because, uh, and, and, and that is why, you know, you have, to, you have to go into a relationship. And I just learned this, uh, that you have to go into a relationship and you have to understand what do you want yeah. from this relationship? Do you want to have kids? Do you want to marry? Do you have this dream about 
growing old with someone and and, and i don't have all that i have i want uh, uh first of all i would like to have a uh, a man that has his own life i don't want to be a man's everything yeah you don't want to, you don't want to pour the concrete on this building you want to maybe uh clean a few uh windows off and and uh, and vacuum a floor and have that building ready to be living in this yeah. whole a lot of a lot of women yes, try to build me, their man someone's everything yeah. it scares me that that i am uh, uh somebody's everything oh you are everything to me wow no that, that, I, that's wrong to go wrong yeah, oh yeah absolutely you know i can say this you know i i love my snoopy dearly she is the largest most important part of my life but yes. uh but i but i have to be my own person i have to have my own interests oh, sure. i have to have my yeah you know it, it's you cannot you cannot live your life for your significant other uh, no, and i think I'm the key exactly. word the, and the key word is other you know they are she is yes. not my very existence she is another part of my existence yes yeah and i admire uh the couples who just click yeah and just stay together for 40 years because there is nothing like a spouse that is also your best friend that is exactly what i have with snoopy and you talk about 40 years we're halfway there 20 years we've been together we've been we've been married for 19 and yeah. and it is a true friendship sometimes she yeah. irritates irritates the living daylights out of me yeah. <laughs> but but she also she she she, she gives so much and I give yeah. so much in return and it's, it's, it's a balance. Uh, and I, and I also see that in our family dynamic in the way we raise our children. Uh, she has some views that I don't agree with. I have some views that she doesn't agree with when it comes to raising our children, mm -hmm. but we agree mm -hmm. on the right things so that there yeah. is a solid foundation for our children to be raised on. And then even yeah. the things that we disagree on is actually good because it gives our children uh, a balancing perspective, if yes. you know what I mean. And uh, so, yes. so it's healthy. Um, we don't have this fantasy image uh, that says that we have to agree on everything. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't, we don't, I, I'm not interested in agreeing with everything my wife says and i hope she doesn't agree mm -hmm. with everything i say and and, and believe yeah. in i want that opposing view and that gives us the 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 foundation for conversation communication and eventual growth for us as a couple so yes. the, i think the very that, yeah good and, and you know it's like uh, when you when you were young you were at school you had this you had this one friend yeah you never, uh, you, you, you didn't like this person because this person was so much alike you, you know? Yeah. You liked it because he or her stood out. Exactly. Yeah. In a way that you liked. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And maybe, and, and often in a different way that you stood out. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, so that is, uh, you, I think, uh, um, if 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 you chose your spouse in the same way, yeah, many of us would do better. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I, I guess the, the things that my Snoopy believes in that I disagree with, those are actually some of the things that I find attractive in her. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, I I see myself as a more uh easy going laid back and compassionate person she is slightly hyperactive constantly stressed and a little bit hard-hearted you know what i mean the polar opposite yeah. of me but i find those things attractive yeah. in yeah. her yes. and i appreciate those aspects of her personality mm -hmm. when they are displayed to my benefit so you see yeah, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. it's that that oppositeness or those things where we disagree yeah. are actually elements that that strengthen our relationship and i, and I think yeah. the realization of that comes with time and maturity yes it does yeah. and you know at the same time as uh, the thing is that when you grow if you meet each other when you are very young you will kind of sometimes grow apart because we we get adults in different ways that's true yeah you know yeah. And, and sometimes sometimes we cannot see that in each other you know right. uh, or we can see it but we can't appreciate it exactly yeah yeah
and that's the difference. And uh, and uh, but you know, uh, uh, a lot of people say, oh well, that was sad that your relationship didn't didn't uh, work out. And are you sad now? Yes, I'm sad because it's it's over. But but um, and you know, girlfriends can say, oh well, he was just using you, and that. And so, well, <laughs> yeah. No, no, stop that. Uh, I'm not angry with him. Yeah, it just didn't work out. Yeah, We had a lot of fun. Yeah. And I remember stuff that I am so grateful that I was able to do with him. Yeah. You know? Uh, so I never look back at, at my scars and think, this is ugly. I love my scars. Yeah. I love my scars in my heart. I love my scars on my body that I got from being pregnant yeah. and my scars in my heart for loving uh, a man who didn't love me back. I love my scars because my scars proves that I am a fighter, yeah. you know, a fighter and I survived and my scars is part of me. It's my scars that make me wise. And make me bold and make me beautiful. My scars are beautiful. Yeah. And, and I, 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 I carry them with pride. So, you know? so beautifully spoken. Like I said, I knew, I knew there was a reason why I liked you, Miss Kim. I, I, I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Wow. You know, I, I guess the only thing, the only negative thing I can say is that I'm disappointed with you for not coming on sooner because I have, I've really enjoyed getting to know you. I wish I could have known you better sooner. Yeah. Well, you know, I might be back. Uh, <laughs> and uh, when I have something more to talk about, and when I come up with my book, I will come here and show it to you. Well, I, I'll tell you this. Yeah. I want you to contact me when I want you to contact me when that book is coming out. Uh, okay. We can we can do an episode where it is it is just a promotion for for your book. I want you to come back to me if you have ever, ever have any kind of theater or acting production going on. Come on back, and I will do everything I can to spread the word for you. Oh, I am yeah. a. I not only am I uh, uh, looking at you as a friend, but I want you to look at me as as a friend and as a supporter for the work that you do. Thank you, and likewise, we will support each other. Absolutely, that's what all about, and that's it's fun. <laughs> it is. It's a lot. Of, well, I like seeing people make it. I like seeing people with uh, success. I like people who. I like seeing people who have that fire in their eye. They're trying to yeah, achieve I something. Me too. And people, people make me laugh, and people make me. Oh, oh, yeah. that's spicy. I never thought about that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I <yeah>. love that. <laughs> Well, Kim, I just want to thank you. Um, this has been a great, great conversation. I want to thank you for doing it. Yeah. And uh, like I said, come back anytime. Yes, you're welcome. It was fine. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. All right, everybody. Okay. Kim, Kim Fairchild. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a nice day. <laughs> See ya. I'm coming home. Oh. Yes, I'm coming home. I'm coming home. Yes, I am, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. Lord, I'm coming home.